Yo, check it, check. What's up, y'all? This your boy Clark and I in the house without a doubt. And you're off the record with Tim and MB. Peace. What's going on, everybody? This is Tim. And this is MB. And this is off the record. And uh, this is where we have conversations with people throughout the culture to bring you plenty game and more insight. And today, uh, we have the pleasure of speaking with the fashion icon. Uh, a pioneer, a creator, uh, a staple in the fashion and hip hop world. Um, I look at this guy as, you know, the blueprint of urban fashion. So every aspiring fashion designer needs to be paying close attention right now. Um, I'd like to welcome the great Carl Kanai to Off the Record. Thank you for being with us today. How you doing, King? I'm doing great. I'm in the house. Glad to be here. Glad to work with you guys today. Yes, sir. Likewise. We, we likewise. appreciate it, man. Now, Carl, just to start off, for the very few people that don't know who you are, obviously we do the grand majority. Uh, how would you just describe yourself quickly to them if you're uh, if you're kind of meeting somebody new? Yeah, well, you know, it's really simple. You know, Carl and I, we are the originator of streetwear fashion. Started back in 1989, Brooklyn, New York. And we call ourselves the originator because before Carl Kanai, there was none. And that's just actual facts when it comes to, according to streetwear for this industry and for the culture. Well, as you should. Yeah, if that's the case, you should be, you know, um, uh, uh, you should be labeled the originator. Um, Carl, uh, I found out about Carl Kanai uh, from being a huge Tupac fan, I, you know, honestly. Um, that was damn near like the only clothing brand that that uh, that that he wore um, uh, before you know he started doing the Versace, uh, and not even just him. Like literally everyone um, in hip hop in the '90s, aka mm -hmm. the golden era, uh, was wearing the Carl Kanai brand from 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 Pac to Big to Aaliyah, you know, just titans. Um, I was just a kid in the '90s, but for me, just being a student of the game, like it, you know, it's it's clear that you had the '90s on lock. Um, what about what about your what was it about your brand that made hip hop just fully commit to the Carl Kanai brand? Yeah, it's interesting. I think because when my brand started and a lot of hip hop artists that were covered at the same time, we were all very young and very innocent and just trying to figure it out. You know, a lot of rappers came from the streets. You know, Carl Kanai we came from the streets, so we had a lot to relate and yeah. common cause between all of us. And I felt that my clothing spoke to them in a certain manner. It the fit, the culture, the vibe, the look, the aesthetics of it just married together with hip hop. And I felt like hip hop needed a clothing brand mm -hmm. and Clark and I needed an outlook to present his clothing brand to the world. So it was like a perfect marriage at the right time mm -hmm. because at this time, back in the late 80s, early 90s, most fashion designers didn't even want hip hop artists in their clothing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. they, they didn't want hip hop artists wearing their clothing. You know why? Because why no one knew that hip hop would last and become as big as it was back then. Yeah. They never so they thought hip hop like, would take it this far. <laughs> yeah. You know what I'm saying? So they felt like if I have hip hop artists in my brand, I may deter my original customer who's buying my clothing. They may not want to wear my stuff anymore. So this hip hop thing, mm -mm, mm -hmm. I don't want these artists in my clothing. Mm -hmm. So that's what we knew. That's what we embrace. So once you real, real recognize real. And that's mm -hmm. why the foundation started for us. Facts. But even before that, um, so like uh uh yeah, you you guys definitely are the the uh, originators. Um, but what would you say, you know, like what brand would you say embrace hip hop before that? Do you think like uh it was Adidas, wasn't it? Like cause run DMC, I know that they had like the uh yeah. they had the My Adidas song, and you know, obviously yeah. they they were heavy with the track suits, but mm -hmm. and, and so that's just crazy to think that. There was no kind of like brand that was, you know, specifically targeted. Fixated in the culture at that time yeah, at all. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Because keep in mind, no one really thought, come on, really? Back then, hip hop was <laughs> underground, yeah. street, you know, inner city type. There wasn't no crossover vibe to it. No one really thought yeah. hip hop would be as big as it is today at all. Mm -hmm. you Did know? you see it being this big? Because it's the most popular culture in the world. Well, to me, it wasn't it wasn't, it wasn't really a, so much of us seeing what it was. It's what we understood and what we knew. Yeah. So yeah. go based on what we know. We understood hip hop. We understood the street terminologies. We understood what it is to hustle. So everything we've done is the same mentality as hip hop. Yeah. yeah. And it's like you brag, you boast, you do high quality stuff. Yeah. You stay true to what it is. You stay true to the culture and always, always uplift the culture. Right. So what do yeah. we do when you talk about uplifting the culture? Is using hip hop artists 
in our clothing advertisements. Mm-hmm. No hip hop artist was never in a clothing ad before Carl Kanai. Yeah. No one looked at them as being models. They looked yeah. at them just yeah. being artists. So we changed the whole mentality of what hip hop artists can be in the fashion industry. And was that hard too, especially because there was no blueprint really before you at all in this in this culture, in this industry. So how was that coming up with those strategies at the early stages? Honestly, man, you know, you know, the fun thing about when you're young, you know, you're fearless and you don't care. Yeah. You just do without thinking. Yeah. And I felt like that's the stage we were on. We were just doing what we knew. We were just hustling. So if I know we like something, the hip hop artists like something, Mm -hmm. then we're good. We're going to put this thing out there. So one day we was at home and I'm watching MTV me and my friends, I'm like watching these rappers on MTV, watching MTV, yo, MTV raps. We seen them wearing different brands on there. I'm like, yo, they should be wearing my brand on there. So what do we do? We just contacted the artist. And they was like, what? You want to give us free clothing? Yeah. To wear? Are yeah. you serious? Yeah. There, was so, there was no product placement back there. Do you understand? Like, yeah. I'm taking you guys back to the time. There was no stylus. Yeah. There was, stylus, yeah. There was no stylus in the game. This is like modern day rock age Mentality. There's nothing existed. It was we the Wild West. Five. Yeah, it was the Say Wild. What? It was the Wild West out there. Everybody was kind of making it the was, rules. Yeah, you know, it was totally different. So we just kind of figured things out on the whim. But at the same time, as we figured it out. Our focus was so strong. Like every day, we woke up on one grind. So how are we going to mm-hmm. promote the brand? That's all we thought about every day. Yeah. Um. And speaking of that, like, uh, uh, I know you're. You know. You know. Obviously, you're from Brooklyn, New York. Uh, but what I, what I kind of thought was interesting is that um, you kind of built the business out here in California um, because, yeah. you know, um, I know that you moved, you know, from New York to uh, to minimize distractions and a lot of the warehouses were out here. Um, can you take us through that process? And do you think that it's important for aspiring fashion designers and, and, and entrepreneurs in general uh, to leave home, you know, to chase their dreams? Yeah, you know, sometimes being at home can be sort of difficult, you know, I feel, you know, because you grew up around people and sometimes people don't understand your journey. Yeah. And sometimes you around people, you tell them your ideas and they're not hyped on it. It may deter you from your goals because they're not hyped on your idea. So, you know, I always believe in a philosophy like make it to the top. The road can be kind of lonely at times Mm -hmm. because you can't expect people to understand your journey. You know why? Because it's your journey. Exactly. You have to understand yourself. So sometimes if you separate yourself from the pack, you're able to think clearly, which I was able to do, and surround myself with nothing. Yeah. Yeah. You know, sometimes the the, the most valuable things in life are free. Mm -hmm. When I say that, I mean thought is free. Imagine you had to pay to think. You know what I'm trying to say? <laughs> yeah. You know what I mean? Like, m- imagine how many powerful things have been created from thought, yeah. energy, light, mm-hmm. flying a plane, driving a car, all these things. Somebody thought about these things. Those are free things. Yeah. So yeah. sometimes to free your mind is so important to be successful, especially when you're young because your brain is so innocent at that time. Is, is that why, I mean, that's why no, not everybody can do this. This, this is not made for everyone at all to have that mindset and to be totally have their creative freedom, I guess you could say, like knowing what it takes and going out and setting out to do it. Yeah, yeah. success is not meant for everyone. You know, this world is set up where you have the super, super rich, yeah, the rich, the middle class, the yeah. lower middle class, this, 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 you know, there's different levels to this game. Mm-hmm. And nothing in life is given to you. You got to go out there and take it. It's not because I'm a cool kid from Brooklyn. My line has been successful 30 years. No, we yeah. put in the work. We stay focused. We we keep that grind on. We see we keep that same hustle mentality that we grew up in the streets. Yeah. Just apply that to the business world. I tell kids all the time that come from the inner city, you are blessed. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Things that kids have to go through in the inner city. Mm-hmm. Kids out here in California, some of these, you know, some of these like better lifestyles, they have no yeah. experience what it is to hustle and go hard in the streets. So the experience we go through, you just gotta apply that knowledge and turn it into the business world. Yeah. You'll be way ahead of the game at that point. Builds a lot of character. Um, yeah. So uh, tough, skin, tough skin, tough skin. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, um, so uh, was the fact that the warehouses were in LA was that uh, uh, another incentive to to kind of start the brand out here as well? Did that help you? Yeah. What happened was we we did our research and we we were looking at what brands we were wearing back then. Yeah. We were wearing Jabot. Yeah. We were wearing Calvin Klein. Yep. We were wearing Guess. Guess was probably one of the most popular brands when I was in high school. So. We did some research and we figured out that Guess was manufacturing your jeans in Los Angeles. Mm-hmm. So we're like, 
I want to make jeans. I, we couldn't find any jean manufacturers in New York. So a friend of mine found us a factory out here in LA that made jeans. So let me tell you what we did. So we come to LA, we had a thousand dollars and we opened a store on Crenshaw. It was two blocks away from Nipsey Hustle store, Crenshaw hey, on 43rd, 4312 Crenshaw was our okay. store address. We were working out of the store. Business was not happening. We were broke, had no money. We went up to the guest factory and my friends broken down Toyota Pinto. And we pull up in front of the guest factory and we just went there. We were trying, we were like, we're going to figure out how to get these jeans. Made. We didn't know what we were doing. We're going to figure this out. Yeah. We made it outside the factory to the workers got off of work. We were like, trabajo máquina, mucho dinero. You <laughs> right. know, I'm Spanish and I should have known all this stuff. I had yeah. to call my mother to ask her how to say this stuff because my family grew us up speaking English in the house. So okay. I was like, do you know how to work on sewing machines? We pay you more money. So finally a guy, some people just walk by and then talk to us. Finally, one guy walks by. He says, oh, okay. So you have a sewing machine. You want to pay me more money? We said, you speak English? He said, yeah. I said, cool, yo, we want to get some patterns made. We want to how to make some jeans. He's like, no problem. I got you. And the guy named Juan, he showed us where to get the fabric from, how to get the stuff sewn. He was a sewer. His wife was a pattern maker. So the linkage just started happening because the hustle mentality of us being out here doing the research kind of just yeah. made itself happen. Yeah. Now, we could have been at home trying to figure this out, complaining. You can't hustle that way. You got to go out there and figure it out. Yeah. Do you think that the Carl Kanai brand would have been um, the same brand that it ultimately ended up being if 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 you would have stayed in New York? Because because New York, you know, you know, is like that's like you know a fashion icon, you know, iconic place. You know, it's obviously it's New York City, and um and obviously L A. It's its own beast as well. But um, I'm just curious, like you know, uh, what do you think about that? Well, no, I I think being in L A. it gave us so much of a head start yeah. on everything. You know why? Because listen, we were from the East Coast. We understood that mentality. Yeah, The West Coast is a whole different mentality out here. Whole right. different vibe. We're able to connect with Dr. Dre, Easy e Snoop, all these artists. All these artists at the beginning of their careers. Yeah. saying, And they showed us so much love. We're able to connect with all the major networks doing all the sitcoms. My stuff was all over the Martin show, all over Live in Living Color. All over these shows, we wardrobe all those shows. Why? Because we're in Los Angeles. Yeah. We couldn't have done this in New York. Yeah, you know yeah, I mean? yeah. yeah. All, everything is filmed in L.A. Everybody Not comes facts. to L.A. Yeah. The fact that we were here, and we just basically took our New York hustle and brought it to Los Angeles, so we had the best of both worlds. Yeah, yeah. So, so, um, uh, because uh, the Martin thing just kind of like you know, um, sparked the sparked the question. So, because. Um, from watching like old like documentaries on the Martin show, because you know, obviously, you know, growing up in our culture where you know Martin is like a staple show, I know that that uh he would always purposely like put on like hip hop, you know, uh, artists on his shows. Um, he was one of the first people, and he would, you know, he would do that with fashion as well. Mm-hmm. Um, I seen stories of him saying that you know he would want to wear certain Jordans and stuff like that. So did he request Carl Kanai for a show? He did. Well, That's I'm fire. not necessarily know if it came directly from Martin, but the wardrobe yeah. stylist. That's dope. They That's dope. Us and said, look, we want this look for our show. I don't even know if you guys know. I posted on my Instagram a few weeks ago. They did a whole show dedicated to Carl Kanai and Martin. Did you what? guys ever see yeah, that yeah. one? Nah. It was, called, it was called Calvin Kanai. Oh, <laughs> Calvin Kanai. I, I'm 100 percent so, sure that 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 uh, I've seen that episode. I just, you've seen it. Yeah, so yeah, Gina, yeah, yeah. she's she's working for a. Um, uh, advertising agency and they, yeah. were, they were trying to they, so they had a guy on a show he had a Carl Kanai shirt on but they just call him Calvin Kanai that's crazy they, they were throwing out different um, advertising yeah like, for him and stuff like that so it was really cool that's fire yeah that's great and just kind of staying on the uh, Martin stuff you know you, obviously with uh, the Tupac All Eyes on Me with Straight Outta Compton as well were you contacted for both of those two that's, yeah that, that was really I mean um uh and it's K- Kenya. She uh-huh. was a stylist for All Eyes on Me. And she worked with um, with the producers of the show. And, you know, they said this won't be a Tupac movie if Carl Kanai's not yeah. doing an award for this movie. Of course. This is reality. I mean, yeah. authentic. It's it what he, this is just what he wore. It's Definitely. just what it was. Yeah. And I'll, t- I'll tell you the story about my first time I met Tupac. But, yeah, they contacted us for both. And we, we, we did all the wardrobe for them. And we made all the custom pieces. We tried to just detail exactly to how the fit and the vibe, how Tupac was wearing the clothing. So it seemed really authentic. That's dope. So, so uh, obviously that the world that we live in now is a very different world that it was when you were, you know, first getting the Carl Kanai brand off the ground. Um, what marketing techniques uh, worked back then 
uh, that you think can still work now? Well, you know, th- definitely product placement is key. Mm-hmm. You okay. know, come on. You know, yeah. there's no better avenue of advertising than having a real authentic person wearing your clothing and wearing it in a way where it's just organic. Yeah, you know yeah, what I mean? Yeah. I think back in the days, everything was just really organic. And it was yeah. just real. Nowadays, a lot there's a lot of payola in terms of oh, clothing yeah. and promoting yeah, stuff yeah, on yeah. Instagram, sure. you know, different things like that. So the culture sure. has changed. And you got to, you know, you got to adjust to where it is because it doesn't matter what I think about where the culture is now. It's going to change no matter what. Exactly. It's about you as a designer adjusting to where things are. But I still think product placement is key. I think the, the impact that, industry artist has on the community in terms of what kids want to buy is still major. So that philosophy hasn't changed from then to now. Yeah. Yeah. You were ahead of the curve because, you know, you know, rappers are like, you know, the biggest superstars on the planet these days. And a lot of these big brands, they're um, throwing these, you know, uh, 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 brands and stuff um, at these rappers because they know that these rappers have the most influence, but you were already doing that, you know, uh, from day from the one. Beginning. Um, but uh, I heard you say say that uh, a streetwear brand would uh, do really well if they gained the same type of real estate that uh, a high fashion brand has. Uh, because these high fashion brands like Louis Vuitton and Gucci, uh, they're in, you know, these high-end malls, they're in, you know, uh, Dubai, they're in, you know, on Rodale Drive and so on and so forth. And you said that if the wealthy um, are wearing, you know, your clothes, then you'll never go away. And I thought that that was like really, really interesting um, yeah. because uh, 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 I read, you know, the, the classic book, Rich Dad, Poor Dad. And um, and the author, he's saying that, well, he said that McDonald's is actually in the real estate business because they own such prime real estate like all over the world. Mm. Um, so they're in the real estate business. They just sell burgers. And then when I heard you say, and, and then uh, uh, one, once I read that, I viewed McDonald's differently. But then when I heard you say that about streetwear brands, that made me, you know, uh, realize that, man, you can apply this to, to every single sector as long as you just have, like, prime real estate. Um, but uh, 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 in today's day, do you think that having a physical store in a prime location um, is as important as having an online store due to the fact that everyone shops online? Yeah, I think, you know, when you think about prime real estate retail locations, you got to look at them more as an advertising yeah. machine. Mm-hmm. You know, and that could still help draw your online sales. Meaning like if you have a store in Rodeo Drive, a lot of stores are probably not as profitable as you think they are. Yeah. By the time yeah. You pay rent or expensive, but it doesn't matter to them because just being there, the branding that you get, the traffic that you get of people coming through LA, seeing your store then, and associating your brand with high end retail mm-hmm. is so important. It's really hard to sell $2,000 t-shirt if you don't have a store. You know what yeah, I mean? Like yeah, you have yeah, stores yeah. in the hood somewhere. It's not going to yeah, work. Yeah. It's got to be where all the princes and the big oil Word. tycoons, all these rich people are shopping at, it kind of puts your brand in a different atmosphere in terms of what people associate your brand with. So mm-hmm. I think it is important to still have retails in the right locations for brand building purposes. Because that that means like the foot traffic can do your brand well just right there. Like you said, not even online stuff, but just being in that part of the neighborhood, people walking by, it's like, okay, they're supposed to be here. They're here for a reason in my neighborhood. So I'm going to go in and get something from them. And I guess that's like a psychological thing too, because yeah. um, like uh, if someone is is driving on Rodale Drive and, uh, and like you said, uh, you may not know if these physical locations are as profitable, but if someone is like driving on Rodale Drive and they just see, you know, your store subconsciously, they're like, oh man, that's a high end brand. You know what I mean? And then, and then that could right. translate um, into uh, 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 online sales. So, so, so yeah, that's a great point. I never even um, uh, licked that. It is off like, like that. Yeah, it's, like, you just yeah. charge it towards marketing expense. You yeah, know, yeah, yeah. Spend a lot of oh, okay. Stores is part of the expense. That's all. Okay. What do you think about these brands too? Just kind of staying on that. Just do you? Uh, what part of it means the most? Obviously, with yours, it's qual- like quality is huge. I mean, quality is such an important thing, and you've wanted to make staples of that. These ones that you see pop up and then die overnight are they just not authentic are they not putting their mind to what's the most important part like what are yeah. what it was missing from a lot of these yeah I, I think that it's a commitment thing and i mm-hmm. think that you know this is a very very tough business mentally physically not physically but it's emotionally and just yeah. like you know, just trying to survive in this business. And like, you know, you, if you have one or two bad seasons, you're pretty much out the game. Yeah. You know, you could, 
you could make a lot, you could lose a lot even faster in this mm-hmm. fashion business. So you're not on top of it. So a lot of people get into it because it feels good. Oh, I got to design a brand. Oh, I got a brand. Look at my brand. It feels good until you start losing money. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So once you start feeling that pinch and start really getting into it, and then you got a bunch of inventory you can't sell, or people ain't wearing your stuff, people's not reordering, yeah. people quit real quick. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Like, you're going to be out of here real fast. Uh, what do you think is more important? Do you think... um well, well, what do you think is more important in business, uh, product quality or marketing? <laughs> well, I, I think, you know, nowadays there's a lot of companies that have proven that quality doesn't really mean as much as marketing. <laughs> yeah. yeah. That's that's crazy. So, you know, yeah. and, but again, this, this business goes in stages. You know, yeah. this is just mm-hmm. where it's at right now. But I do think that Instagram has allowed a lot of other companies to survive in this business because with Instagram, kids now can't especially girls they don't want to wear the same outfit twice mm-hmm. on instagram mm-hmm. so every time they post you gotta have a new outfit yeah so if you're buying i don't know if you guys remember the time when there was those expensive high-end jean craze like true religion oh yeah yeah. Yeah. yeah yeah remember you cannot get caught out there if you didn't have an expensive pair of jeans on yeah. like you know what yeah. i mean that yeah. was just the buy. yeah yeah nowadays that means nothing mm-hmm. girls they don't care like for two hundred dollars, you go to some of these fast fashion companies. They'll be able to get ten outfits for two hundred dollars. Yeah, you know yeah. I'm saying, and still look fly. Yeah. on the Instagram. So yeah. Instagram has changed that game so much that people want a lot of clothing for less cost to look fly yeah. on Instagram. So that's, that's just true. kind of the way the industry is right now. You kind yeah. of have to find your way through that until it changes. Because you're right. That's such an opposite of just what it was with those expensive jeans, even expensive stuff. Now it's I want more for less as opposed to I want the most expensive thing out right now. Yeah, I think girls are still invest into a nice, uh, some shoes and a pocketbook. In terms of yeah. clothing, it's almost like just disposable clothing. Now. Yeah, yeah. No, that's 100% It's like clothing's true. the accessory almost yeah. at this point. Exactly, yeah. Yeah. exactly, yeah. yeah. No, that's facts because, um, you know, because, you know, obviously, you know, we live in a digital age and Instagram is a huge thing, like you were saying, but, um, you know, if someone takes a picture wearing an outfit on the gram, like they can't wear that in public ever uh, again. Uh, like it's done. done. It's, you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You gotta wear that to the grocery store, <laughs> exactly. Yeah, yeah. Shop, something like that. Yeah. Yeah, Play give it basketball. to your little brother or yeah. something, you yeah. know. Uh, <laughs> right. but um, so so today we know that there's a lot of people that uh start clothing brands by um by buying shirts and hats and whatever garments from a manufacturer or a third party, and then they just you know stick a logo on it, but that doesn't necessarily make them a fashion designer. Um mm-hmm. So, but, uh, you know, uh, I've heard you speak on that as well. What are the qualifications uh, uh, to be considered a fashion designer to you? Like, do they actually have to sew or or can they just have like a great eye for fashion, but they know how to, you know, piece fabrics and garments together? Like, what would you say? Yeah, because, you know, I didn't do this thing the traditional way. So yeah. mm-hmm. if when I came up, if there was a rule to determine what a fashion designer was, I'd have failed. Sure. Yeah. I didn't, go to, I didn't go to design school. Mm-hmm. I didn't know how to sew. But what I did know, I have great vision. Yeah. I know what I like, and I know how to put ideas together. And I know I understand the philosophy of surrounding yourself with people who not who knows how to do things you don't know how to do. Meaning, yeah. like I don't know how to sew, and I don't need to get a sewer. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I don't need to make patterns. Get a pattern maker. But yeah. sometimes you get you get. I could hire the best pattern maker. It doesn't mean they have good ideas, but they know how to make great patterns. Yeah. yeah. Well, a sewer doesn't mean they're going to come up with a, the dopest new style, but they know how to sew a good garment. Yeah, so yeah. why can't I have the ideas? Talk to a pattern maker. The pattern maker makes my pattern. Uh-huh. Give it to a sewer. Sewer sews it. Let me be the visionary of the brand. So yeah. that's kind of how I came to this bill because yeah. I make people like what I like. Yeah. What yeah, I like yeah. is dope. So it yeah. just kind of worked together. Yeah. It's, it's that classic... We don't care who's like cooking it up. We just want to know who's serving it, right? Exactly. Just make yeah. it taste good. Yeah, just I mean, make that shit taste good. I guess, yeah, I I'll, guess as long as you have a good team, right? Exactly. Yeah, absolutely. I want to go back and touch on, um, you know, we we talked about Pac a little bit in uh, in the previous questions, but just kind of wanted to know a little bit more about your guys' like personal relationship. I know more than just a business friend, you know, knowing him in the business, you guys were f- actual friends. Yeah. And so I kind of wanted to know a little bit that you took from him, some of the stuff that he inspired you with and vice versa as well. What he's con, you know, what were the conversations with him that were like, man, I appreciate you, you know, talking to me about this and that. What did he learn from you and vice versa? Yeah, absolutely. Like, you know, Pac was a really special guy and, you know, you realize how special he is even now, today, 30 years later, how important his music, how relevant his music is in the songs. And just that one, the one song changes. Yeah, yeah. It's almost like he wrote that 
last month. Yeah. And he's so relevant to this day. So my story with Tupac was like, you know, he used to wear my clothing all the time back in the days before I met him. Mm-hmm. And keep in mind, back in the days, it was really hard to get in touch with people if you didn't really know him because there's no, there's no, there's no Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, or cell phone. Yeah. You know, you got to call the record company, yeah. get his house phone number. Yeah. You know, it's almost like we're living in, in ancient You times. weren't accessible at that time. There's no accessibility. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 So um, a friend of mine is AZ. He knew one of the guys, Stretch, that used to hang out with um, mm-hmm. Tupac from Queens. And we set up a meeting because Tupac used to wear my clothing all the time. He had it on in an MC Breed video. He put it, he had it on in um, Gotta Get Mines. He had it on in Dear Mama. Did you he know? wear it in the uh, the uh, the uh, above the rim? But, but, uh, what was he wearing it uh, in above the rim, or am I off? No, not not in above the rim. He wore it, um, you know, definitely all eyes. No, well, Tupac himself. No, he didn't have it on above the rim. Oh, okay. Above the rim. But you know, he's worn it. Oh, he wore it to the premiere of Poetic Justice. Oh, okay. Oh, fire. To, yeah. to the premiere of Poetic Justice. So basically, I wanted to meet him. Mm-hmm. So we got in touch with the record company through Stretch. And he told us he's going to be at the Beverly Hills, at the Nico Hotel in Beverly Hills, Hotel Nico on La Cienica. So I went there to meet him and we go to his room and we knock on the door. He says, come in. And this is the first time we ever meet face to face. And, you know, he's warm. my call him, but I don't know him. Yeah. So we go into his room and he's he's at he at the desk and he's like writing a script to a movie. And we're talking and. I went there for a reason to ask him a question, but I was waiting for the right moment to ask him. Yeah. There was only one problem. He never looked at me in the eye. He was writing, having an intelligent conversation, but never looked up at me. So I'm trying to get a read on him, right? I'm like, okay. I, feel, I know he's a Gemini. I'm a Gemini. So I guess it's like a feeling out process, right? <laughs> hey, I'm a Gemini too. Oh, June 13th. So, there you go. Let's get May 23rd. It. In the oh, house. there you go. There you go. Okay, there, there we go. go. Special so, people. I'm in there with Tupac. And we're having a dope conversation. He just wouldn't look at me. And I'm like, I can't ask him this question. This dude ain't looking at me, right? So I'm like, so I, uh, then he's smoking blunt after blunt. And he's talking. And so I remember room service came and knocked on the door. So room service comes. And I was like, okay, I'm going to ask him now. I remember the room service guy comes and he puts a towel over his mouth because there's so much smoke in the room. And he's like, I was like, yo, Pac, how much did you charge me to do an ad? And he got really quiet. It felt like five hours. He didn't say nothing. And I'm thinking to myself, damn, I fucked up. I shouldn't have asked him. Fuck. <laughs> then he goes, he looks at me. He's like, yo, you black. I don't charge my people for nothing. And my heart go. just started like beating because that's not what I expected him yeah, to say. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Then he goes, then he goes, hold on. I want one thing. I'm like, I'm like okay, here we go. How much you want? Pop. <laughs> He's like, yo, I want you to put Thug Life in some of the ads with me. Can you put, he asked me, he says, can you put Thug Life in some of the photos of me? I'm like, hell yeah. I said, that's it. He's like, that's it. And then the whole, then the, then the Gemini pop came out. The other side of him came out. Yeah. Then he yeah. started laughing. He started, then, he, <laughs> then the whole, he then it, like that just broke the ice. He's like, yo, I got this idea, man. I want to do this. So he basically visually directed the whole photo shoot within seconds right there. Yeah. He's like, I'm going to do this ad for you. I'm going to be sitting on top of a basketball rim in Harlem no shirt on, but your cock and I shoes on. I was going to be killing with my chain on. And then I want to do another one with me shit on the toilet. Like I'm taking a shit. I don't have some cock and I drawers on. <laughs> and they start wilding. Yeah. Everything, everything he said happened. That's crazy. Two weeks later, we did, we were in New York. We did the photo shoot. Thug Life was in the ad. Came out the sickest campaign we ever did. Yeah. And the man said, yo, I want to blow your line up bigger than anything else. And he didn't even want no free clothing. He wanted to pay for the clothing I was giving him. That's how fucking yeah. real he was. Yeah. Like I've never met anyone more realer than this guy. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Right not not uh that's crazy. Um, and you know, uh, I know you probably, you know, get asked about Tupac a lot, but yeah. you know, to me, he is the greatest figure that hip hop has ever had. You know what I mean? Like just just the greatest figure. I think the greatest artist of all time uh in hip hop is 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 Kanye, even though he is controversial. I think the greatest rapper is Jay Z, but the greatest figure in hip hop is is Tupac. And, and and as soon as you you Google Tupac, it's just seventy percent of the pictures are just him and just Carl Kanai gear. Just um. Yeah, yeah. So uh. So yeah. So but uh, but thank you for that story. That's yeah yeah. That's super dope. Um. So uh uh in today's day when everyone has a clothing brand, you know, with the internet age, uh, uh the market can uh can look really really saturated. Um, if you were coming up in today's era, do you think that it would be harder or easier for you? 
you know, because of social media, it could be somewhat easier mm-hmm. because if your shit is dope, you could touch a lot of people very quickly. Yeah. Little money. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know what I mean? Just imagine like you were connected to say Travis Scott or, yeah. you know, Rihanna or some top icon, right? Right there. Yep. And they were like, I really love your brand. I want to wear this brand. You able to touch millions and millions of people mm-hmm. by this person wearing your brand, which before the only way of advertising before that we had to do was hand to hand combat is either you place an ad in a magazine, which costs sometimes 20,000, 30,000 for vibe for source magazine, or you have to get yourself placed on a TV show. And the chances of that happen is very slim. Do you know what yeah. I'm trying to say? Yeah. Yeah. So it was very difficult back then as compared as to now in terms of getting your brand out there. Now there's a lot more competition now, but what is life without competition? That means you just got to dig a lot deeper and work a lot harder and come up with something that's that more different than what's out there. So mm-hmm. you could take it how you want it. But I feel like nowadays can be easier if your shit is dope and you're different of what you're about. Because regardless of the competition, if it's dope, it's going to hit. Like if so it's dope, it's going to hit. This yeah. is what it is. Like, you know, no, no, one monkey don't stop the show. Like, you got to just get out there and put your brand out there and believe in what you're doing no matter what. The hardest thing, the hardest thing is the belief. Yeah. Once yeah. you believe... You make other people believe what you believe in. But if you already doubt yourself, you already failed before yeah. you began. Is there is there a lot of um do do you see a lot of people get too emotionally involved too? Like they start something and then they don't know necessarily when to stop when it's not hitting, and then they keep losing more, they lose more, they lose more. Do you see yeah. that quite a bit? I see that a lot. And I, what the more important what I see a lot is that most people want in life instant gratification yeah that part you know i mean like you know people feel like if i start something today like by next week this thing better blow up like mm-hmm. i gotta get you know why is my stuff not selling they don't know what people go through before they get to this certain point like we were we were at times we were, we were just broke we had nothing we were like living in the store on crenshaw we couldn't even, couldn't even afford a mcdonald's breakfast but yeah. in New York, I was living okay. But yeah. I came out here on a grind. I, I refused to go back to New York as a failure. Yeah. So sometimes you got to have that mentality that I will die before I fail type of thing. Like, you got to think like that to make it in this business. Because otherwise, go get a job and work for somebody. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, if you don't want to take on everything that comes along with being an entrepreneur, then you're just not built for this. Go play it safe. Go get a secure job. And then that's yeah, it. Yeah, then you're good. Yeah. Yeah, Pay yeah. a little taxes. Get you a little check. Yeah. You're good, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Don't complain. You're yeah. good. Let yeah. the boss man deal with all that. You don't have that's to right. deal with that. Yeah. That's right. So I guess there's like a, a fine line between, okay, you know, um, your, your, your stuff isn't hitting yet, but you are dope. You're just a couple tweaks away from really, really taking off and then, and, and then still pushing it. Or that other side to where it's just like, this might not be for you, right? So yeah, p- yeah people got to distinguish that. Absolutely. So um uh uh I've always been like a uh, uh, a huge fan of uh vintage clothing and and to me you know once a brand reaches that to me you know in my eyes that means that that brand is timeless um mm-hmm. and uh and and I honestly feel that way about Carl Kanai you know you know you know um uh, I feel like that Carl Kanai is is a timeless vintage brand um uh you know like uh the Carl Kanai shirt that uh, that Tupac always used to wear with uh, the cursive on it, like to me, yeah, yeah, yeah. to me, that's like you know, what I mean, some some like legacy type of stuff, uh, 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 right there. Um, like, how do you feel about that vintage label? Like, are you, yeah? I mean, I'm good with it. I, I like it, and I'm cool. You know, I, you know, just so you know how I think, I like to accept each moment that comes our way. Yeah, and I try not to reflect too much on history in the past somewhat. I think one day if I ever done that, I'd probably drive myself crazy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. If I really just sit back and reflect, like I always like to think forward and think ahead of the time, ahead of the curve, like what's my next step? But being considered to be vintage right now is really cool. It makes me want to continue to work that much harder to continue this thing that I'm doing mm-hmm. and continue the legacy going stronger. So I feel like you take these things in, but you keep the machine going at the same time. You can't yeah. get caught up I mean, it has to be like that badge of honor too, where it's like, you know, what other street where like who else is here that started it? Like there's no one else that started it that is still here. And even like the, uh, you know, I kind of wanted to go into the 
you know, the, the reemergence in 2015, especially yeah. with the new guys too coming in with Migos being a big hand of that too, was how, how did that come about first of all? And how have you seen kind of this new younger generation of kids kind yeah. of come into the brand? You know, the Migos thing is very interesting and I will tell you, it all started with Quavo. Uh-huh. Um, so Quavo them had worn some of my stuff to a stylist and I guess Quavo was, was liking the vibe. So he, he sent me a message on DM and he says, yo, I'm trying to get at you. That's all he said. Trying to get at you. I was like, That's that right, industry cool. shit. <laughs> <laughs> He's like, I'm trying to get at you. And I was like, cool. So you know, I'm going to tell you straight up what he said. He said, yo, we want to blow your shit up. We want to, we want to be like Big and Tupac. We want to blow your shit like Big and Tupac. That's dope. That was his goal as a black person to another black person saying that that meant everything for him to like, look at my brand, like, yo, we want to rock your brand. Yes, sir. And we just had the greatest relationship since then. I mean, he was just real. He wore it in like so many videos. Um, the album release party, they wore it too. Uh, when they came out with, uh, I think it was Culture 3, Culture mm-hmm. 4 it was. Okay, yeah. And so that kind of started the introduction to the new young generation with Migos and awareness. I'm very thankful to Quavo for reaching out to the brand and rocking it the way that he has throughout the years. I think that was really real. And that mm-hmm. shows you the power, what happens when we kind of do things together in this culture, how we could uplift each other in yeah. a major way. Hell how have yeah. you seen, how's the reception been too from like the, the newer generation? And uh, It's dope. Seen- but you know what's funny about that? It's like this new generation, you can't push anything on them. Yeah. Yeah. They gotta discover it on their own and come to you. You know what I'm saying? Like because of the internet, they do their own research now. Mm-hmm. It's seeing what was happening in the 90s, who was cool in the 90s, yep. who was the dopest artist in the 90s. They say Biggie, Tupac. Mm-hmm. What were they wearing? Yep. Oh, shit. Biggie did a song. You mentioned Carl Kanai. Mm-hmm. Tupac's wearing Carl Kanai. Pete Rock CL Smooth. You know, all these artists are rock- rocking this Aaliyah, one brand. Like what, is, that, yeah. what is this all about? So it kind of took a life of its own. And there's one thing that money can't buy it can't buy legacy, mm-hmm. and it can't buy history. You know what I mean? Like, no matter yeah. how much money you have, you can have a billion dollars today, right? Yeah. You're trying to start a brand. There's no way you could take this brand today and make it seem like it was here in the 90s. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. You can't do it. Yeah. So what we got is that legacy and history, which is just just reality and it's real to the culture. Yeah. 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 So, um, so many clothing brands like yourself started uh, in New York, you know, like FUBU, Tommy Hilfiger, uh, Calvin Klein, Ralph Lauren. Um, obviously, Sean John Rockaware and and even Supreme now, which has been killing it for uh, for the past few years, uh, and the list goes on. Uh, what is it about New York that breeds so many you know designers? And 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 what are some of your favorite clothing brands from New York? I just think New York is just the culture. New York has always been very fashion forward. Yeah. You know, hip hop started back in New York. New York was very flamboyant. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Show me what you got excuse me, showing off your clothes and showing off your style, your jewelry. So it was very a flamboyant thing. LA fashion back in the days was more gangster clothing, dickies, yeah. tackies, you know, Chess. black, white, very simple. So yep. it was kind of a mesh of flamboyancy and chill. So that's why I felt like New York kind of brought that energy and that vibe. In terms of in terms of designers, like coming up, honestly, like the brands that we wore coming up was like Calvin Klein, mm-hmm. um, Ralph Lauren. Like if you wore Ralph Lauren polo shirt in the hood, everybody thought you was a millionaire. Yeah, you know yeah, I mean? yeah, like, yeah, yeah. You, know, you put a little polo horse, or if you wore eyes on the car shirt in the yeah, hood. Yeah. Thought you. So you know what me and my friends used to do back then? We had no money. We used to like take off the alligator and put it on the shirt. Like, put the <laughs> oh, alligator. that's fine. Okay. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> how we used to get yeah. busted, sometimes we used to put on the alligator and it used to be crooked. You know, They'd be like, it's just real. Yeah, yeah. Didn't uh, Biggie <laughs> say that, um, uh, or, or uh, didn't Biggie say that uh, in a song when he said, so yeah, he did, alligator he did. on my it's shirt? True. Yeah, yeah, that's yeah, what we yeah. did. That's wow. what we did. Yeah, yeah. that's crazy. <laughs> um, but yeah, that's it. part of it. So those are the designs that we wore. And then, like, yeah. I didn't really have any role models in terms of designer, stuff like that. Like, I... I started making clothing just so you know, like the reason why I got into clothing is I was born in Costa Rica. My dad's mm. Panamanian. When we came to the United States, my dad used to get his clothes made by a tailor. Yeah, he used to right. go to Manhattan, buy his fabric, go back to Brooklyn to his tailor, make a clothes for him. So I kind of saw the process of how my dad was making clothing. Yeah. So when we moved to the inner city in Brooklyn, East New York, fashion was so real. We was 12 years old. I'm thinking we're going to go out and play. Kids, these niggas ain't trying to play. They want to know yeah. what kind of sneakers you got on, yeah, what yeah, shoes you yeah. got on, what kind right. of jeans. I'm like, yo, this is crazy. So I wasn't into fashion back then. So I went to my mom. I was like, mom, I need some money to buy some clothing. These kids are making fun of my clothes. They said, you got it from the grocery store. 
which is <laughs> back then he still called in the grocery store. Yeah, right? and that's what yeah. I told him. Yeah, 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 yeah. the food department to pick me up a pair of jeans. You know what I'm yeah. saying? So like my mom's like, boy, you better go out there and find yourself a job. Right. So I was like, what? At 12 years old. Yeah. So I got me a newspaper route. 5.30 in the morning, delivering newspapers, all because I wanted to get some clothing so I could be one of the cool kids in the project. So that's kind of what got me into it. And then you started making yeah. it. Yeah. And then all of a sudden, how was it for that first time? That, hey, I want to know what that Carl can... I want the Carl can I design. Oh, I want no, the no, Carl it Williams. Start off the, Carl, it didn't start off as Carl can I, I tell you. So basically, um, I went to my dad when I was about 15. I asked him, can I make an outfit with his tailor? Because all my friends, we used to shop at the same store. So we didn't want each other to have on the same thing. Uh-huh. So we wanted to be cool. So I, I thought about my dad's tail. I was like, okay, I'm going to make an outfit with his tailor. So I bought five yards of linen and I made a jean suit, jacket, and pant out of linen. But what I did was I made it more baggy because we couldn't find the clothing more loose in the store, yeah. but everything mm-hmm. was tight. We couldn't yeah. find it. And we was like doing hip hop dancing. So when I wore that around the hood, it was like, oh shit, where'd you get that for? Where'd you get it from? So you know I ain't about to give up my secrets. I said, yo, if you want one, I'll make you one. Yeah. So I have dudes give me wads of cash to make them the outfit that I had on. And yeah. that's kind of how I started making clothing. But the most important day was one day we're sitting in the park. This is like uh, 1988 or 87. And I was bragging to these girls saying I made this outfit for this guy. His name is Joe. And back then, everybody was hustling. He's one of the big hustlers in the projects, right? Mm-hmm. They didn't believe me. They said, tell him to come over here. He comes over. She says, who made that outfit for you? He's, he's like, Carl made it. Why, what's up? She's like, can I see a jacket? He takes it off. He shows it to her. She's like, yeah. But if Carl made it, how come his name ain't on it then? Mm. She was being a smart aleck, but she was so right. Exactly. Yeah. I wasn't branding. I wasn't thinking about branding. I wasn't thinking about no designer name. That was the last thing on my yeah, mind. Yeah. Yeah. I was trying to make clothing. When she said that to me, it hit me. I was like, I need to put my name in the clothing. Because mm. I'm because when you don't put your name, you don't own that clothing. It could yeah. be anybody's clothing, yeah, right? Yeah. So I go home and I was I used to I used to have a little DJ crew. I was playing this song by Phil Collins called in the air tonight Mm -hmm. right over and over and over again for hours thinking of a name thinking 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 i was like i want to be like a designer because you know keep in mind back then being a designer wasn't a cool thing to do be Mm -hmm. you know i'm saying no one wanted to be labels of fashion you know the 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 stereotype of they have fashion designers back then right yeah so my father changed my name to an American last name when he came to the States, to Williams. So I was like, Carl Williams Jeans. Just didn't have a good ring to it. Just yeah. did not hit it, right? Can I, was a question I used to ask myself all the time. Can I do this? Can I come from the inner city of Brooklyn and build a clothing brand and make clothing that other people's going to wear? I didn't know the answer to that, but I knew. I called myself that, that every day I have to answer that question. Yes, I can. So... I didn't want to be CK like Calvin Klein. So I just changed the K. I put it to all K's. K for Carl, K for Kanai. And that's how yeah. Carl Kanai came about. There you go. That's a crazy story. I was actually um, going to ask you about that. Did you ever, you know, uh, thank old girl for that? For, for sparking that idea? <laughs> you know, we were so young back then. I was kind of, actually, I was kind of pissed off at her at the time when she yeah, said it. Yeah, she yeah. kind of embarrassed me, you know, like put me on the splash. Like, yeah, uh, yeah. But I haven't seen her since. But I do owe it to her to thank her for sparking something in me and make me realize that yeah, yeah. I really technically did not own that brand, did not yeah. own that clothing because my name was not in those, yeah. in those clothes at the time. Are you yeah. thankful for that too? Because I feel like though, you did it the right way. You made the clothing for you. Like you did, you put your love into it and then everything kind of came after that. But I think yeah. a lot of people that don't last, they do it the wrong way. Like they, they do it just for the money. They do it just for, oh, for that. Yeah. I'll tell you, if you're doing this thing for the money, it's, you're not going to do it for long. I'll yeah. tell you that much. Yeah. Because you, I'm telling you, you lose a lot. You make a lot. You feel pain. You feel pleasure. You feel pain. You feel pain. You feel pain. You feel a little bit of pleasure. So it's almost like a fix. You got to keep it going. But if this is what you meant to do, you're gonna find a way to keep it going for sure. So, um, so, uh, so, Carl, um, you know the the culture lost someone. Well, the world lost someone great this year as well. We lost Kobe Bryant. Rest in peace, Kobe Bryant. Yeah. Um, that's uh, you know, actually, me and Tim's favorite basketball player of all time, yeah. childhood hero, just off of his mentality alone. But um, there's a video of him on uh, on YouTube, a popular video actually. Uh, before he's even uh, in the NBA, he's in high school giving a high school yeah. presentation to his classmates. Yeah. Then you zoom in and you can see that he's wearing a Carl Kanai sweater. 
which is yeah. crazy. Did you did you ever know uh, or, or Kobe uh, during that time, like before he got drafted? No, no I didn't know Kobe back then. Um, he actually wore wore, wore Carl Kanai multiple times because um, once once I realized that, I googled Kobe Carl Kanai, and and there's like multiple pictures of him wearing yeah. Carl Kanai, and I was like, damn, Kobe was on it <laughs> early. <laughs> Yeah, uh, Kobe was on it. You know, we we used to cater to a one good account I had called Farouk Bernini's. He used to sell to a lot of the athletes, so I felt like a lot of athletes went to them. And then keep in mind, the most important thing again, it goes back to that first suit that I made. Remember, I told remember I told you guys when I made that linen suit, what I did differently about it. Remember what I said? Baggy, yeah, baggy, yeah, fit, 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 yeah, fit, fit. There was nobody out there making clothes that could fit these athletes. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Nobody. Yeah. Yeah. No one. Yeah. That was cool. I mean, they did have big and tall clothes. It was all cheap, stupid looking stuff. Yeah. 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 Black yeah. People. You know I'm saying like it wasn't cool stuff. We made cool clothing that cool guys with money want to wear. Yeah. So cultural thing is a fit thing. It was a timing thing. So we were there. And again, we were part of the culture. We understood what the people needed. We understood that guys have different body types, different physiques. Mm-hmm. So we have to make clothing that's going to fit them. So that's why it kind of the marriage is this real between us and athletes as well during that time period. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Did you have a chance to meet him at all and kind of talk to him about I that? I did. I did. Yeah. I did. So I'll tell you when I met Kobe. I met Kobe at the NBA All-Star Game in Philadelphia. Don't know what year this was. Was it, the year, it, was it the year that he got booed, but he, but he won the MVP? I think so. I think that I think was so. 01. Oh one or oh two? Yeah, because he something about a sneaker or something. I forgot what he did. Anyway, yeah. So I meet Kobe in the elevator. We both happened to be in the same elevator, and he saw me. And keep in mind, back then, I'm not sure if he knew it was me at first. Mm-hmm. He says to me, "He's a." He looked at me. He's like, "Cool shirt, man." <laughs> I thought for that shirt. <laughs> he's a cool shirt, man. I was like, "Oh shit, Kobe, thank you, man." And after that. We smoked, we smacked each other five. And then he had this under, uh, undercover police guy that was with him. He told him to get my number and we exchanged numbers and we stayed in contact through that way at the time like that. So yeah, yeah. That. So that's the first time we met is an elevator. Wait, so like, did he know that you were Carl Kanai? Like he just seen your shirt and he just said, cool shirt? See, that part I don't know. I don't know <laughs> yeah. if he's trying to play major cool. I don't yeah, know. Yeah, I just yeah, happened, yeah. It, just, it was just crazy the way it happened. We just happened to be on the same elevator. He says, cool shirt. And I said, Yo, Kobe, can we connect? And he told the security uh, police officer to get with me. And then after that, he became really cool. So I'm not sure if he knew it was me, but he definitely made a compliment on my shirt. Yeah. Hey, shout out to I, if he didn't, though, because that's exactly. like, man, it, like, that's it was just a dope. Cool vibe. Yeah, yeah. Vibe. Yeah. Well, one thing man. we know, you know, we know that we know that he was, care. yeah, yeah, we know that he was clearly, you know, um, a fan. a fan of the fashion just, for sure. And he was, um, I watched the podcast that he did with Mike Tyson, and you were saying um, how things you've seen and experienced in your upbringing. Um, you know, uh, makes any issue that you may face in the business world look like very, very small compared to what you, you know, uh, dealt with in your upbringing. Mm-hmm. Um, what what was the biggest oh. challenge? Yeah, what was the biggest okay. challenge that you faced in the business world? Oh man, I think making people believe, Word. making others believe. Yeah, and we're trying to do like when we got into Macy's. You know, back then, department store business was very important. And yeah. when we got in there, they didn't know where to place us. They didn't think it was going to last. Yeah. And I remember they put us next to Ralph Lauren Ooh. and Tom Hilfiger, mm-hmm. and they complained about us being next to them. They didn't yeah. like the, the the crowd we were bringing into the store yeah. at the time. I'm going to do my parents to this. So we had to break down a lot of barriers to make them know that this is not going anywhere. But our sell-throughs were so strong. Yeah. AC is like, no, we got to figure out where to put this brand when I did my first appearance, we had 2,000 people show up to get autographs signed for Carl Kanai at wow. Macy's 34th Street. So the energy was just a movement that couldn't be stopped. You know what I mean? So yeah. I think it's a lot of that. And I think that, you know, just um, coming up, getting over these humps of this business and transcending time and being able to come up with a hit collection mm-hmm. time after time again, because we had no room for failure too much because if we failed, we'd be out of business. So I think just being really safe and secured and figuring out the next plateau of fashion was probably some of my biggest challenges. Because that's kind of like a little bit of foreshadowing. You got to definitely look ahead to see like kind of where you're going to. Did you kind of see those things like w- that lane of where you wanted to go? Did you have to kind of read the future a little bit? Yeah, you know, you have to read the future and, and kind of trust in yourself as well, too. Yeah. Because like yeah. you don't really know for sure what's going to be. But if you trust what you have is right, 
you trust what you have is going towards the culture that's going to like transcend the culture and transcend time and moments and fashion to be timeless, then you got to believe in yourself, make people believe in what you believe in. Because again, what makes another designer smarter than you? Why should his idea yeah. be better than yours? Do you know what I'm trying yeah. to say? Yeah. It's just an idea. These, yeah. every, no one knows for sure where anything is going. Yeah. But one thing I know, if you don't believe, you don't try, yeah. you will always fail. You, that I know. Do you remember, yeah. the, does a certain time even stick in your head of that moment that you did believe and you kind of let go and was like, look, I'm going to let this shit just speak for itself. I, I believe in myself and trust myself enough to know that this is going to hit. Do you remember a certain time that that, that, that hit you? That I, that I did believe? Yeah, that you did believe that you were just like, I know this is going to, this is going to go yeah. that where you just fully. Yeah, honestly, I try to think like that all the time with everything I do, because yeah. I think a lot of times people don't think like that because they're afraid to fail. Yeah. So you, sometimes you're hesitant to do things. You're afraid of what the results could be if it doesn't work mm-hmm. or what people are going to think. But you got to have that. I don't give a F attitude sometime mentally sure. to just do things, let it. And, and once you do this a couple of times, it start to work. Then mm-hmm. you'll see organically, this is how you are. You, you, now you're charged. Now you see the success of what happens when you do believe in yourself. And then you really feel motivated. Then, you, then, you, then it's like almost like your, your, um, your confidence level raises 10 elements because now you've shown and proved that what belief could do once you believe in something, how successful that can be. Yeah. So, um, like, uh, uh, what is the goal for... Um, Okay, well, everyone's goal is different, obviously, but like, um, let's say that someone is starting uh, their own fashion brand uh, right now. Should the goal be to just, you know, um, eventually just um, uh, build up a great, you know, fan base of people that are committed, you know, to buying your clothes? Or um, should it be to, you know, eventually partnership? Like, how does that work in, you know, the business sense? Like, like do, do fashion brands partner with these, like, you know, other big companies as well to get, you know, um, yeah. to, to get more exposure? You know, partnerships are very tricky. I've seen a lot of nightmare partnerships. Yeah. I've seen many, many designers get their brands taken from them. Yeah. So a lot of designers you've seen from the 90s, they're not around, not because they don't want to be, because their brands got took. How did you know they get I mean? taken? But, but I, I know that's a fact. You know, a lot of these designers, they go to companies. See, here's kind of how it works. Yeah. Let's say you have company A. They're a big company. They're well financed. They've been in this business for a long time, right? They got the shipping. They got the receiving. They got the manufacturing. All these things they have down packed. Yeah. Because they don't have, they don't have a brand. Yeah. Right. Exactly. Here goes Joey from the hood. Yeah. Joey got rappers in his stuff. Joey got people wearing his stuff. Joey got people, you know, wearing in videos. Joey got a movement going, right? Yeah. But this is what Joey don't got. He don't got the shipping and receiving. He don't have the exactly. finance. He don't. He don't have all these yeah. things. Company A has right. So guess what? Company A does now. He gets with Joey, or Joey comes to him like, man, I want some backer behind me. I need this. I need that. Yeah. So he does a deal with Company A. Company A may offer him a deal like this. Hey, man, Joey. Yeah, man. Look, we'll we'll do a we'll do a partnership with you. You know, Joey, to get the banks to really back us, man, I need to, we got to own 51%. I know you don't mind, right? But you, we'll give you 49. So the Joey, he's not, he's like, well, that don't sound bad. You get 51, I get 49, right? That don't yeah. sound bad, right? Yeah. And guess what else we're going to do for Joey? We're going to get an employment contract, right? We'll give you $200,000 a year employment agreement. We do a one-year, two-year agreement, right? So Joey, this sounds really good, doesn't it, right? He does this deal. His line is selling. Now, company A, now, all they want to do is milk his brand now for cash. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Milk it, make as much money. Because they don't give a shit. Because they know if this don't work, we're going to move on to the next one. Yeah, keep yeah. Moving, keep, yeah. I'm going to make as much money off of Joey I can. Yeah. So after they milk Joey's brand out for two years, right? Guess what happens to that employment agreement they gave Joey? They don't want to renew it. Yeah. 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 And, yeah. and guess yeah. what? Remember that 4951 thing? How important is that now? Because you know what happens when you own less than 50, right? Yeah, you give you're, up your, your uh, majority you're, you're ownership. Not, you're not the sole you're not person. majority yeah. owner. You don't you're make not the, you're not, you're not, You don't own the majority. So guess yeah. what company A does now? Joey, look, this ain't going to work out, man. This ain't going to work out. We're just going to have to take this thing. Just, we're not losing money. The bank's not working. Thank you for your time. You know what Joey could do now? Nothing. Yeah, because he, he doesn't own it. Nothing. Yeah. His brand has just got ganked. That's crazy. Okay? Mm-hmm. And I've seen this story time and time time again in this industry and rightfully so kids need opportunities they take these chances but there's things that go along with it you know so these are the 
ups and downs of this crazy business that we're in. Yeah. Are, are these, are yeah. these some of the similarities too with, with fashion and even music? And I mean, music is so same, much. Same, it's all same the same formula. shit. Yeah. Yeah. It's all the same formulas yeah. of, of getting them yeah. into that contract. And, and that's what it is. Like they'll never get out. The, they, they soon realize they're not even making any money. And these are really uh, important things that, that, uh, that uh, aspiring, you know, fashion uh, designers or whoever uh, needs to know just because, uh, you know, uh, a lot of people find out about these things the hard way. Um, yeah. And and like you said, uh, uh, where their whole brand is snatched from them. Um, I also heard you say in the interview that something you realized early uh, in the laws of business uh, was that uh, if I can get you, I'm going to get you and we can still be friends. So, um, so, uh, you know, uh, me and Tim, we've actually dealt with that with another venture, you know, uh, with someone else as well. So, um, I understand, uh, what you mean by that, but can you expand on that? And do you, you know, still like follow those, those, uh, those rules today? <laughs> yeah. You know, this business is, is a very, um, it's a, excuse me one second. It's a very cutthroat business, yeah. business in general, just the way it is. And, you know, I've seen guys from the old schools have been doing this business for a while, the more poised businessmen, you know. It ain't personal with them. You know, yeah. it's like if you have something I want and for designers, what they want is your trademark. Yeah. yeah. That's the that's who owns your company. Who owns the trademark? Mm-hmm. That's who owns it. So that company that owned the 51, 49 percent thing, that trademark is part of that company. Yeah. So the person that owns 51 really owns that company. Mm-hmm. So once they get that, they got what they wanted. So, you know what? Me and you could be cool. I don't want no beef with you, but I yeah. got what I want from you. Oh, so now you're begging. I'll give you some peanuts. So I'll, I'll, I'll give you some yeah. pennies on the dollar. Yeah. Well, we can still be cool. I'm not going to stress my life out. I got what I need from you. And I'm yeah. good. And that's just the mentality. And you have to kind of learn these things yeah. in the time period. Of how they smile in your face, laugh in your face, mm-hmm. but they're going to take something from you that they want. When it comes to money and business, yeah. own your trademarks. That's the key. Do not give up ownership of your trademarks. That's the key to this business. So is that how these companies are able to just snatch these labels um, from, from, from? Okay. So 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 people really they just need to um, trademark everything, right? And then that can prevent uh, something. No, like no, that what, no. Once you tra- but see what happens once you trademark it. In order for the company to invest money into you, they're going to say we need to own part of your trademark. Got it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And then, yeah. and they, and they, they do have a point there. They want some yeah, type yeah, of guarantee. Yeah. You just can't just take like I invest a million dollars tomorrow. You go leave. Yeah, I can't have nothing to. So once I own that trademark, you ain't going nowhere because yeah, I got yeah. it. Got it. You know what I'm saying? Crazy. So there's no it's the ways around that. Yeah. And you, I mean, have you take, taken people even under your wing too and try to mentor and stuff like that? Or is that even part of the rules of like, nah, what the fuck? Like, this is still such a competitive business. I can't give you certain, you know, certain tips and tricks and stuff like that. I have to protect my own. Nah, I mean, this is a jewel. You know, yeah. well, if I give you a jewel, it's not going to affect my business anyway. Yeah, I mean, I just get most important, some, some most important jewels right there that yeah, I didn't sure. know. When we first got to this business, we had to learn. Yeah. But we just went about getting my stuff back a different way than most people do. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Like, yeah. We approach things in a whole different mentality. Yeah. And we realized going the 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 way of lawyers and all that shit, that shit, you never win that. Yeah. It's not yeah, about yeah. it's not about so who has the most money wins. That's yeah. how that works. So how does the Carl Kanai brand um uh, operation today work from a production standpoint? Like, do you have um in-house designers like how do you get your fabrics and your garments? Like, is everything produced in America or, or overseas? Um, please tell us what you feel comfortable telling us, just because, you know, I know you can't give out all the sauce on camera. <laughs> yeah, I mean, but, you know, we're, we're, we're cool about it. Like, you know, our business is set up in three different channels. We have um, European distribution, which we have one of the best European partners anybody could buy. It's a company called Snipes out of Germany. Mm-hmm. They, um, they have over... 400 stores. They just opened up 200 stores here in the United States. They bought out uh, Kicks USA and Mr. Allen's. And um, they are my distributors in Germany. So we have a tight design team. And now we're in 25 foreign countries there. Mm-hmm. And then we have 10 stores in Japan through my partnership with Mr. Bishi. And then here in the United States, we run carlknight.com from my studio here. We run carlknight.com. So we have three different divisions yeah. and three different collections per se to kind of fit each market the mm-hmm. way that we want. So we kind of run our business slightly different, but it works for us in terms of where the market is now. And how? And obviously, you're you're someone that I feel like need, wants his hand in every part, that wants to know everything, kind of signing off. And you know, you this is your vision from the beginning, obviously. So, do you see yourself doing that a lot too? Of like every little 
proportion? Do you stretch yourself a little thin? Not so much because, you know, I think like in my other uh, companies that we have, uh-huh. like Europe, Europe and Japan, we have a whole massive team there. Okay. So they kind of do all the heavy lifting and just send us stuff for approvals and design. Mm-hmm. We kind of oversee that. With Crocknight.com, I'm more hands-on with that. Yeah, the it. reason why is because like this is like my baby and what I like, and I do things. We don't do a, a collection every month. We kind of do it when I feel like it. Yeah. yeah. But I thought it was important that I, as a designer, I'm able to express myself how I feel and catch trends the way I want and not mm-hmm. have to go through the same system yeah. everyone yeah. else does. Exactly. But that's that's what makes it so exclusive too, of like there's no set timetable also. So you know, yeah. it's not like it's you're you're coming out every single season or every single time or on a set date. You know, there's a right. level of exclusivity with that. Is it important for a fashion brand to keep up with the seasons? I think so. I think, think so? you got to be on point. I think yeah. that um, your stuff got to be right. I think you know, the kids out there are really smart. They know what's up. I think it's important to kind of have your brand connect with some of the hot sneakers that are coming out at times. Yeah. If you're going to be in streetwear business, I think it's important to know what's hip. And associate yeah. yourself with the right artist that's going to represent your brand in the right way as well. Mm-hmm. So what other uh, business ventures besides fashion uh, are you uh, involved in that people may not know about? I'm not. I did the record label thing oh, you back did? in 2000. Did Can I Life Records. We had oh, okay. two rappers out of Brooklyn. Yeah. They were really dope. But it became more of a babysitting job. And yeah. I'm not a great babysitter. <laughs> you know what I mean? I uh, didn't really feel the energy of trying to pump up somebody else to work hard yeah. and do the things like that. So I, I realized that this wasn't something I wanted to do. Mm-hmm. So no, I don't really have any other business that I do. You know, fashion is my life. Fashion is what I do. And we love what we do. And yeah. we stay kind of focused and stay in our lane. I think there it's important go. for me. Carl, what's, co- what's coming up, man? What, uh, what, what can we look forward to? We got the really, really dope collection. We did one drop on carlknight.com. It's mm-hmm. coming out. Um, November November 23rd Okay, it's coming out it's really cool so the last collection we did was the Tupac collection it was last year June because of COVID we kind of um, wasn't really that in tune to launch a new collection at the beginning yeah. of the year but yeah. I feel like November would be a good time right before Christmas so we're looking forward to that yeah, I got to get some of that too. Yeah, absolutely, address is um, coming. No, yeah, so uh, so for Carl, so um, uh, just to wrap up, um, uh, these last five questions, these are very. Uh, introspective questions, but you can just try to give us, you know, quick, short answers. Um, okay. When was the last time that you pushed yourself outside of your comfort zone? The last time I pushed myself outside of the comfort zone was about last month, I think. Mm-hmm. I did yoga. You did <laughs> How, uh, or, uh, or, uh, Did you do hot yoga? <laughs> I did hot yoga. Hot yoga is It was hot, too. It was really hot. That yeah, was the yeah, thing. Yeah, yeah, intense. It was really hot. Yeah. But you know what? They told me they were so proud of me that I stood, I hung in there for the first time doing it. And I felt like I challenged myself differently normally. It was all mental. Yeah. You know, be yeah, the hot is. and do these poses. So I kind of hung in there with some of the guys that have been yoga in for a while. Yeah. So I feel yeah. really proud of that. Yeah, I, I did that. it one time and and I haven't been back. But uh, <laughs> yeah, but, uh, I love that. Yeah, I'm, I'm definitely trying to make that, you know, part of my normal routine. Um, so uh, uh, what was the last uh, small act of kindness that you did for someone? There's a guy in my neighborhood downtown here. He comes from Dominican Republic and I guess he's homeless. Yeah. But he's such a smart guy. It's like he always has two different split personalities and he's talked to him. Like mm-hmm. some days he just be totally zoned out. Yeah. The other days you come up and talk to him. Every time I see him, I make a, my point to drive and to get to him to give him something just as a token because I enjoyed the conversation that I had with him one time. So... Mm-hmm. I don't know how much it means to him, but it means a lot to me to see how appreciative he is at times when I give him this. And then sometimes he doesn't act appreciative, but I know he does appreciate it. I think sometimes yeah. in different zones, but I do think it's important to connect with people. When something about him, I do connect with him. Maybe it could be the Spanish background or something yeah. like that. Yeah. I think That's cool huge. Guy. I love yeah. that. Those type of things, you know, um, definitely do a lot for people. I love that um, spirit too. Yeah. yeah. So, so um, what is one area of your life, you know, whether that be you know, your work life, your family life, your health life, spiritual life, love life, whatever, um, that you feel that you need to give some more attention to? I would probably say my my family life. Family life? I've definitely yeah. um, been very over-focused, I think. Mm-hmm. Yeah. At times, certain things can kind of get overlooked. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, and, yeah I know, and I know, and those things I know, and yeah. I'm trying to find that way of balancing the two together because I know everyone wants your attention and it's important to give that yeah. And sometimes I feel like I could be too much 
driven too much in business sometimes. So I probably need to work on that. And I know that. And I talk to my moms about it almost every day. So yeah. Yeah. those things, you know, you want to be perfect, but sometimes you can't. But no, you know, definitely. At least I think the first thing is understanding your faults and then you can adjust from there. Exactly. Absolutely. Um, so what is one good habit that you want to gain and one bad habit that you want to drop? One good habit that I want to gain, um, I have a bunch of good habits. <laughs> there you go. No, I eat well. I work yeah. out. Yeah, I, my, I got my little Peloton bike in here. Because I see. You. There we go. Yeah, 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 yeah. I see you. you know, yeah. I turn my studio into a gym. I got my little pull-up bar over there. Damn. There you go. Decline bench. Um, in terms of habit, okay, maybe I need to be focused to be a little bit more spiritual. I think, Word. and maybe um, be closer to the one. Yeah. It, I yeah, think sometimes I feel that energy if that I could help that. Yeah. The other question you had was any habits that I want to drop? Yeah. Mm, I don't know. Maybe I could smoke a little less weed. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> hey, hey, but uh, but you know, if it's helping you, not hurting you, then you know, yeah, yeah, why not? Matter. That's yeah. right. Yeah. yeah. Um, so uh, uh and last question, um, what is your overall purpose? My purpose is to change change the world of fashion. You know, I, the 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 quote we came out at the beginning is, you know, Clark and I started Streets of Brooklyn, New York in 1989. Mm-hmm. We wanted to change the way the world looked at us in regards to fashion. 30 years later, 30 years strong, we'll never forget where we came from. There you go. It goes out to everybody who's rocking their canines from day one. Peace, one love, Clark and I forever. That's deep. Fucking Carl deep. can I, man. Carl, um, you know, please give us some final words, you know, and uh and you know, let us know anything that we should look that uh, uh that we should look forward to. I just think that you know everything in life is attainable and is achievable. Mm-hmm. I mean, I'm living proof of that. Yes, you know, sir. Started from the bottom with nothing. But I do believe though that one famous thing I would say is that you know, if you can't see it, you can't be it. Exactly. I mean, you can never get to where you're going if you don't know where you want to be. Yeah, 100%. Yeah, like if somebody says, I want to be successful, I want to be successful, I want to have a million dollars. Okay, well, how do you want to do it? Everybody wants to be successful. Yeah, how? You yeah, have yeah. a plan and you got to be dedicated to that plan. Yeah. And failure is never an option. I love Thank it. Thank you, sir. Carl Kanai, man, we appreciate you coming on, joining off the record, man. We we really appreciate it. And uh, like I said, not not every day we talk to a, to a legend here. So we can't thank you enough, man. Yes, thank sir. Thank you. You know what? There's only one issue that I have today. Uh-oh. What's that? I need you, and I need you in a Carl Kanai shirt. So you're going to text me. Oh, man. Man. Oh, my God. You're right. Bro, oh, the we second we're all, oh, we're on the ASAP. Carl, Carl, we're on it, yeah. baby, and you, I, you, yeah. you know it. I'm not the one to ask. I'm just glad that you brought it up. Who had called me on my cell? Was it you or you? Yeah, that was me. That was yeah, me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. yeah. Hit me a text me the information. I got you, bro. I appreciate got you, it, Carl. Can I appreciate you, man, for uh, coming on off the record, man? We're we're signing right, out. Ten MB. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Appreciate it. Thank you.